Growth factors, are they worth the hype? I'm Dr. Shah. Dr. Maxfield. Welcome back to our channel, Dr. Lee, where we talk about all things skincare and dermatology. And we spent the last 24 hours trying to decipher how skincare brands market growth factors. And we have a lot to uncover here. What are growth factors? Are they worth the hype? How do they work? Who are they for? Who could they be dangerous in? This is one of the most complicated ingredients to actually unravel. In addition, it can be one of the most expensive ingredients for your skin, but it may not have to be. We'll unpack all of this, we'll teach you how to use it, and help you get some product recommendations along the way. All things growth factors, here we go. Here we go. So what in the world is a growth factor? So our body naturally produces growth factors and the way that they work, they're signaling molecules that act on receptors on our cells. So to give you an example, there is a signaling molecule called epidermal growth factor and it acts on a receptor within our cells called epidermal growth factor receptor. So these two attach to each other and then it causes a cascade of signals within the cell and it tells the cell to do something. Maybe it's to differentiate, maybe it's to mature, so on and so forth. So it's a signaling molecule in our body naturally produces this. And because of these benefits or because of these actions, skincare brands and other companies have basically reproduced that effect naturally. Right. And so what happens is when you have these different signaling molecules, you get different benefits. And there's a lot of different types of growth factors. So just for example, he mentioned epidermal growth factor. This can act on fibroblasts to increase collagen and increase elastin. You also get an increase in glycosaminoglycans in the extracellular matrix, which helps with plumpness. You can get increased vascularization, angiogenesis. You can get increased healing. So the list goes on and on. And overall, some of the primary benefits you'll see clinically are going to be more just healthful, revitalized skin, improvement in texture, maybe tone, but that's kind of on the fringes of what this can actually do, but really just more healthful, youthful appearing skin. Now, what the heck is a growth factor though? Because when you turn over most of these products and you look at the ingredient list, you're never going to see, not never, but most products, there's only one product I know of where you're actually going to see the word growth factor on the ingredient list. What you're going to see is it's a bunch of peptides that you've never been familiar with. So how does this figure into the picture? Well, amino acids, when they form a bunch of amino acids together, they become peptides. And when a bunch of peptides form together, they become proteins. An example of a protein would be something like collagen. Now, growth factors are peptides. They're chains of amino acids. And when you put a chain of amino acids together, they can produce a specific action. So we could theoretically call the growth factors just another form of peptides, which has become this sort of ubiquitous term in skincare. But these are specific ones that act on growth growth factor receptors to produce an effect on the cell. Right, and so then how do you actually get these? Well, they're sourced different ways. So some of these growth factors are actually created from humans. Some of them are, well, not necessarily humans, but they are human derived, often from something like foreskin. Then you have some biologically created ones, which is how you create a lot of peptides, and you can actually have a vegan version of it, which is done through yeast and fermentation processes. So again, it's kind of a range of how you actually get these, but it does make a difference in terms of how they play with your skin, and it also might make a difference in terms of price point. Now, now we've gone through all of the research on growth factors and they've been used in many different ways outside of the benefits in cosmetic dermatology. So I'm just going to go through some of the studies that we read. There's some, been some studies on wound healing. So wound healing is when the skin is really compromised. For example, you get injured, cut, you've undergone surgery. And when applying growth factors, it can actually speed up the wound healing process. Again, this is causing differentiation. It could speed up your skin cell turnover and help you heal a bit faster. It also helps in radiation dermatitis. So radiation is usually when we apply radiation through the skin to treat some type of cancer and radiation just damages everything in its path and it becomes very difficult to heal because your blood vessels are damaged in that process. Now, because this can actually cause angiogenesis to increase or the production of blood cells, it can actually help radiation dermatitis heal a bit better. It's also been shown to be helpful in acne, which is there's a little bit of nuance here, but in the treatment of cancer, we can use something called epidermal growth factor receptor inhibitor. And that's because in some cancers, epidermal growth factor receptor is upregulated. And when we use these inhibitors, sometimes it can shut down cancer cells. And so in the treatment of these cancers, a lot of the patients in those studies suddenly develop acne by inhibiting those receptors. So it turns out if you activate that EGFR receptor, it can actually treat acne in some cases. So I would never consider growth factors to be like a standard of treatment in acne, but it makes me pretty confident that if you're using a growth factor product, it could potentially have some benefits in acne and probably won't cause acne, at least in those patients. So it's just a little nuance there. It's a little, little nugget that we learned along the way in treating cancers. Next is wrinkles. And this 
is where we really use it mostly in dermatology and skincare because it can increase hyaluronic acid and collagen synthesis. And then in some studies, it's actually shown to have a pigmentation effect on melanocytes by decreasing pigment production. Wouldn't it be my first line treatment for hyperpigmentation either, but there are some preliminary studies in that direction. And so that's what it can do for your skin, but what are some of the concerns regarding this ingredient? Well, one of which is absorption. Because growth factors, especially the human-derived ones, are fairly large, very large in terms of molecular structure, they may not pass through the stratum corneum or the top layer of the skin readily. That is the first barrier to entry for any ingredient working. Now, there are some studies showing that the growth factors can be absorbed through other mechanisms, through your hair follicles, through your pores. So depending on how your serum is formulated, it could enhance the penetration of the growth factors. So one, in these new engineered forms of these growth factors, the molecule could be small enough to penetrate into the skin. They can also be packaged in what we call a liposome, which is more easily absorbed into the skin, or we can use penetration enhancers. There's also some techniques that we can manually do to increase the penetration of ingredients, and we'll talk about that near the end of the video when we talk about how to use this in your routine. Now, the next concern would be, if you're using a growth factor on the skin, could it cause things to grow abnormally on the skin, and that could that be dangerous? So the likelihood of that is purely theoretical. It's just that when you have a type of cancer, sometimes they upregulate the receptor for growth factors, meaning that there's more of that receptor. So if you have more growth factor, more receptors, perhaps it will grow more. Again, to your theory, is this real world important? Maybe not. If you have a lot of skin cancers already, should you think twice about it? Perhaps it wouldn't stop me from using it, but it is just something to consider. Right. So we do know that some forms of cancer will have more epidermal growth factor receptors. By stimulating those, could it cause a cancer to grow abnormally? Theoretically, it could. It's never been proven. It's also never been proven. It's actually been shown that growth factors aren't mutagenic, meaning that they don't actually cause cancer. They could cause cancer to grow faster, but they wouldn't necessarily cause a mutation in your DNA with, that would then cause cancer. But always something to look out with. We always try to look at the mechanisms of things and trying to be on the lookout for potential outcomes. In fact, Dr. Maxwell and I discovered a really early outcome of a medication back when you we were in med school 10 years ago of a cancer drug that we anticipated based on the mechanism. And then it became widespread knowledge that these medications actually had the side effects. So not saying that this is going to happen with these growth factors, but it's always good to pay attention to the mechanism and worry about potentially what it could cause later on in life. Just be on the lookout. Nothing that would keep us from using these serums. Now let's talk about some of the serums that are available on the market and some of the nuances between these different serums. Right. And we'll, uh, we'll probably organize these a little bit by price because these again can be very expensive. They might also be relatively affordable. It just depends on what you are looking for or willing to spend on a product. So we'll kind of work our way up here. The first product then, if we're looking at price, would be a new one. This one's actually by Dermatology, a brand we've talked about a lot before. We have this one here. You can try it out, but this is their needleless growth factor serum. So different from what I think is like their needleless serum, which is the peptide serum. This one adds in growth factors and it has multiple different types. It has epidermal growth factor, insulin-like growth factor, VEGF, vasculoendothelial growth factor, and then transcription growth factor, two different types of that, which makes it five. Now, like Dr. Shaw mentioned, when you look at the product list, it is nowhere on the inky. So why is that? That? Well, it's because it's blended into these types of oligopeptides. And even if you count those, there's only four, but there's five growth factors because they put two of the growth factors and one of the peptides as a trade name. So it's really, really cumbersome to decipher growth factors and peptides. It took us hours to decipher these ingredient lists to figure out what the growth yeah. factors exactly were. And we finally figured it out. So ultimately this serum, it's actually a really nice serum to just apply to the skin. And it would definitely replace your hydration serum just in general. It also has other peptides that are well known in it. So that combination that forms matrixyl palmitol tripeptide 1 and palmitol tetrapeptide 7 is also in this. It also has multiple types of ceramides. And so overall, it's just a really nice serum, but it has these really proven types of peptides. Pretty insane clinical study on this product to prove that it's effective, especially at this price point that makes it a lot more, like makes me a lot more confident in it. At this price point, it makes me a lot more confident in it. Sorry, it's, it's late in the day. <laughs> Yes, so um, basically what they did is they did, they replicated something we see in the pharmaceutical space a lot. They took the leader in the space in terms of what was probably considered the best growth factor serum out there, the one with the most evidence, and they compared theirs head to head to it. So it was like a $295 growth serum versus theirs. It was put in front of an institutional review board, so IRB, and those individuals reviewed it, made sure the study was well thought out, et cetera, et cetera, ethical, et cetera, et cetera. And then it was a 12-week study with 20 individuals. And interestingly, by all the clinical endpoints, 
points, not only was this product non-inferior, meaning it had good results compared to the expensive one or the leader in the space, it actually outperformed it. And this is notable for two reasons here. One is just, again, kind of a marker on price. You don't necessarily have to pay an exorbitant amount of money for something that works. But two, it is actually a nice comparison because this one, the dermatology product is vegan. It does not use human-based growth factors. And this was compared to a human-based growth factor product. So again, it shows that while they are different in structure, shape, et cetera, the human ones versus the non-human ones or the vegan ones, they're still signaling molecules. And so although there's not a lot of data out there, they probably still have the same endpoint and effects. Yeah. And the other thing that was nice to me about this study is that it's what you call a double blind study, meaning that the patient doesn't know which serum they're trying and the evaluator, the dermatologist also doesn't know which one the person tried. And so when they're evaluating this person over the course of the study, they just look purely at the outcomes and then someone else, once all that data is in, attributes to which serum they were actually using. And then it showed that it was superior in a few of the endpoints and statistically significant for that, which is a really good sign. So it gives me confidence to use it. I've been using it pretty consistently and I like it quite a bit. The next one after that, which is a very popular serum from a brand that we also love and trust, and that's Allies of Skin. This one is, this is one of my guilty pleasure products and it's only a guilty pleasure because of the price point. This is I think $180, maybe up to $200 at times, but it again combines multiple peptides. They have a 9% lifting peptide complex. And again, these are also listed in terms of oligopeptides. So it's, you know, it does use multiple different types of growth factors. Aesthetically, love it. Sits beautifully on the skin, just like all of the Allies of Skin product. It's just the price point. I really do love this. They have a lot of thoughtful formulations in their product lineup. And this is just another, another banger, as Dr. Shaw might say. <laughs> so, phenomenal serum, you know, 3% SH oligopeptide. So it's that growth factors. It also has copper lysinate, but it's not blue, which makes me think that the copper concentration in this is quite low. Copper lysinate isn't usually as bright blue as other forms of copper anyway. But in general, this is a beautiful serum, beautiful packaging as always from Allies of Skin will perform incredibly well. And they have also done some really great clinical studies on there, albeit at a much higher price point for people. But if you like the brand, you can find a discount code, you should definitely check it out. And then the last product is from Skin Medica. This is the one that I think has been around the longest. There's been a lot of data behind its use. Really, I think was very prominent in physicians' offices, although we don't hear about it as much anymore. But this is kind of a flagship product. Price point is about $300. And it has, again, the studies to back up its clinical use and the benefits you'll see. Yeah, so it's like Dr. Maxfield said, extremely popular amongst physicians, probably maybe five, 10 years ago. I haven't heard much about it lately. I haven't really heard anyone talking about it lately, but it does definitely have a cult following and it has a plethora of clinical data around it to support its efficacy. Now, this one is derived from humans, specifically the foreskin. I haven't personally tried it, but it definitely has a cult following. And so if you're looking for growth factors derived from humans that have been around for the longest, this would be the option to go with, again, at a much higher price point. Yeah, I feel like if you're a growth factor purist, if that type of consumer exists, this would be the one for you. It really is kind of like that idealistic type of product that has been the gold standard for some time. Now, we're gonna talk about how to use growth factors, and there is some nuance here about what you do and how that will impact the results you'll see. Okay, so when using this in your routine, it's simply cleanse, treat, protect. So you can cleanse at night, use one of these serums, moisturize in the morning, cleanse, use the serum, use sunscreen. You can layer it with other actives. A lot of times it is going to be stable with other actives as well. And to increase the penetration of some of these ingredients, you can simply use something like a retinoid or an alpha hydroxy acid, which is often used in even in medicine and dermatology to enhance the penetration of certain ingredients. So that's one simple hack. You can also break your stratum corneum and there are several ways to do this and that can enhance the penetration of these ingredients as well. Right, so if you're looking at traditional treatments, in the office, you will see something like called microneedling, where you poke thousands of holes in the skin at very specific deliberate depth. And then after you're done with the treatment, you'll apply a serum for whatever your concern is. In this case, growth factors would be perfect because that will help it absorb much more deeply and enhance the benefits. If you do this at home, one way that it can reasonably be done is actually with micro stamping or a micro infusion device. The one we've talked about the most and certainly have backed most solidly is the Cure micro infusion system. And that's because this uses a sterile head 
single use, and it's also with very deliberate length needles. So the risk of infection, the risk of irritation, the risk of damage to your skin from the needling is much, 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 much lower than with something like a traditional derma roller. Yeah, we were talking earlier, this is one of the most thoughtful uses of microinfusion because this is an ingredient that can have difficulty penetrating in the skin. By creating these tiny breaks in the skin, it can increase the penetration of these ingredients. Again, I've always said, you can get this done at the dermatology office, microneedling, laser to enhance the penetration of these growth factors. But if you're going to do it at home, please, please learn how to do this properly. That means cleansing the skin before. If you have a hypochlorous acid spray, spray it on the face, allow it to dry, micro stamp, and then allow that infusion to seep into the skin. And then afterwards, just simply moisturize. Don't do anything crazy. Don't use a needle tip over and over again. You just don't want to introduce infection or irritation that's going to set your entire skincare routine backwards. Right. So those are pretty much the ways to use the ingredient. It's gentle. It can fit into most people's skincare routines because it is a peptide. It blends well, plays well with other ingredients. Just be thoughtful about how you use it and what you're expecting to see from it. So really in summary, we've kind of talked about what growth factors are, which products you might want to use, how to use it. And I think it all comes down to this though, when picking a product, because this can be a more expensive product, you just want to balance affordability and efficacy. And I think of all the ones we listed, which were the three, we picked three that had actually good evidence to know that they work. So I think with any of the ones we mentioned, you can feel confident that you will see benefits. It's just up to you on price point. And honestly, I think there's no reason that you would have to pay a higher price point for this ingredient. Yeah, I would look for one that's more affordable, that has good clinical results behind it so that you can trust that it's actually going to work. So if you're gonna spend the money, you wanna make sure that it is going to work. So sometimes going to the lowest price ever, though sometimes it can be tempting if they don't have good clinical studies behind it, that can also be concerning to some extent. So how does this actually fit into the overall hierarchy of how we always explain skincare? I still think a basic skincare routine where you focus on your cleansers, your moisturizers, your sunscreens first. And once you have those foundations, you add thoughtful active ingredients in. So let's say you're trying to tar target aging, a retinoid would be the most proven ingredient in this phase. And then once you feel like you have this down, this is when you would add in ingredients like peptides and growth factors to see those enhanced results, especially if you're targeting those signs of fine lines, wrinkles, and aging. Yeah. So there it is. Those are growth factors. Hopefully this has helped you navigate this complicated, complex space. And is it worth the hype? <sighs> I think it is because it's kind of a novel mechanism. So anytime there's something that actually introduces a new complementing benefit into the skin, I think it's worth exploring. And I don't think the hype on growth factors has been over the top, like we've seen with some other ingredients, even like hypochlorous acid this year. So I think it's worth the hype, the reasonable hype. Yeah, it seems to be reasonably hyped. And the person who discovered growth factors actually won the Nobel Prize. And, and it's been around actually for quite a bit of time. And so I do think it has some staying power. Time, of course, will tell how these ingredients kind of stack up against time but i think in the moment of today worth the hype worth the hype all right thank you all so much for tuning in please like comment and subscribe and we'll see you in the next video we'll see you next time first off this is one of those times where we are reshooting this video as you can tell this is my bed head i have already gone to bed i've already gone to bed but i'm back he's in bed i send him a text i go bad news growth factor video all blurry <laughs> terrible terrible news for dr maxfield it's past his bedtime and a lot of people don't know how we shoot these videos so we shoot these on the weekend so after we do all our work seeing patients during the week we spend the entire weekend shooting videos and they are extremely extremely long days and so this is the end of the tail end of a shooting weekend with dr maxfield where i woke him up from bed to reshoot this video so you know it's important that's the point where you know it's important if we're reshooting this one.